for Monday, February 25th, 2019. We have a couple of presentations and staff reports this evening. Our first presentation, delayed by <laughs> a few days, is on the National Historic Trail Strategy Concept Plan. Um, this was a item that we had on our agenda at the council meeting on um, Tuesday. We did go ahead and pass the resolution um, regarding this, but because of the weather, we were not able to have the presentation, so we're going to have it this evening. Mr. City Manager, would you like to introduce our presenter, please? Be my pleasure, and thank you for that introduction, Mayor. So it's such an exciting project. I think we'll just jump right into it and ask Marlene Nagel from the Mid-America Regional Council to come up and share this exciting project with us. Thank you, Marlene. Well, good evening. Thank you for your indulgence of allowing me to, um, to postpone the presentation to tonight. Um, we're excited about this plan and um, we know how important it is to the City of Independence. Um, we started this plan uh, several years ago working with uh, local officials across the area, with um, regional and local trails organizations, and with the National Park Service. And the purpose of the plan is really to look at the uh, three of the national trails that go through the greater Kansas City area and try and identify as close as possible an alignment for visitors, whether they're residents of our community or visitors from out of town, to be able to really experience the history of our communities, to visit historic sites, to um, traverse the trail landscapes and really get a sense of uh, what um, the history, the importance and the value of the history of our community. Um, there are 19 his National Historic Trails that have been designated by Congress and four of them actually go through the greater Kansas City area. This plan addresses three of those uh, National Historic Trails, the Santa Fe, California, and Oregon. Um, and the retracement trails are viewed as modern, uh, but they're also viewed as non-motorized routes. There are some sign, there is signage around the community that designates uh, driving routes that people can take to try and get, again, as close to the alignment of the national trails as possible. But this is meant to be more of an on foot or perhaps on bicycle route that people might take. Um, the plan in also includes um, some guidance around signage, uh, trail features, and ways to interpret the elements of the uh, historic routes uh, and to tell the nationally significant stories. Um, so uh, in our work, we also worked with a landscape architecture firm, uh, Vireo, and we, went, we worked with cities along the entire corridor from Sugar Creek uh, to Gardner, Kansas, um, and it was, uh, the work was built on some early work that the National Park Service did in South Kansas City in the Three Trails West area. So they were sort of a pilot project to, to look at how this kind of a, a process might work. What we heard from the National Park Service was that there are national um, historic trails uh, retracement plans like this around the United States, but most of them deal with um, very small geographic areas, uh, portions of one community, that this was really a unique project for the National Park Service. And so it goes through um, communities from Sugar Creek, uh, Kansas City, Raytown, uh, in, in addition, uh, Independence, and then on the Kansas side, uh, Leewood, Prairie Village, Overland Park, Lenexa, Olathe, and uh, ends in Gardner before it leaves the the Kansas City metro area. And we, um, we had the interest and the support of a number of the trails organizations and what the N National Park Service said was really unique um, as well, in addition to the number of communities and the geographic distance was the density of historic sites along the three corridors. And they made a distinction between what they see as purely recreational trails and these national historic trails that really they're, they should be recognizable and distinct. And so signage and uh, design features and interpretation really do make a difference. And so in the plan um, that we uh, pr uh, produced with the National Park Service, it gives a lot of guidance um, to that end. 
um, in the um, executive summary that's in front of you, and I do have a few extra copies if someone from the um, audience would like one. Um, and it shows the routes of the, um, uh, the three trails and the approximate routes um, through the, the greater Kansas City area. And in some cases, including in Independence and Raytown, for example, the trails um, that we're suggesting are very close to the actual historic uh, routes. But in other cases, um, they're up to a mile or so away from the actual historic route, and that has to do with respecting private property or maybe some uh, to topographic challenges or uh, limitations due to streams or highways or other um, barriers that um, would prevent uh, public access. And so it, it um, gives you, and the plan provides a lot of detail about the route, and so from Sugar Creek we actually identified several routes that would take visitors um, from the Sugar Creek area to say the around the Independence Square and then there's several options for um, going uh, along or through the Independence Square area and then taking routes south um, to Raytown. And um, the plan is really a concept plan, and so it's not, there's not a specific alignment that needs to be respected. We were really asking each community to look in detail. And, at the time the plan was completed, some communities had been able to complete their planning process, but others are still working through it. And I know Independence is doing some planning work around the square. And so at some point in the future, the city might identify the specific alignment and then uh, work on um, signage and trail features and interpretation uh, to go along with that particular alignment. Um, the Mid-America Regional Council Board adopted the plan in, in January and um, called for its use um, as we develop our new long-range transportation plan over the next uh, year and a half. And then as um, uh, our organization asks local uh, communities and other um, project sponsors to submit projects for funding, um, this plan will be one plan element used in, um, in rating the projects for, or ranking the projects for um, funding. And then we are asking the communities all along the alignment to consider adopting um, uh, first a resolution of support, which you have done, so thank you for that. Um, but as you um, complete your work in identifying the alignment to perhaps put it into your local plans, whether it's a a uh, local trails plan, a parks plan, or a comprehensive plan. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Marlene. Are there comments or questions from the council? Yes, council. Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, looks like a lot of good planning um, has occurred already, and I guess Mark is coordinating some of that. Is that right? So we worked with the, the national trails. The yeah. National Park Service and their staff was um, instrumental yes. in developing the plan, their expertise and knowledge of, um, uh, of the National Trails uh, program and then the information they were able to bring. And then we used a landscape architecture firm that also worked very closely with city staff. So will the National Park Service have anything to do with some of these trailheads or the mark, markings, uh, the signage, uh, the trail um, so for bikes we, or pedestrians, sure. things like that, will they? Uh, they have guidance that we have included in the plan and, and I think they would hope that as the city might um, develop the trails and develop the signage or the design features that they would utilize that guidance. Um, we do have a small grant from the National Park Service and we've offered um, we have $15,000 for the City of Independence to perhaps use that for um, a segment of the new s of the system, um, perhaps uh, paying for signage or um, some either for um, directional signs or Great. Uh, interpretive signs. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilman. 
Arlene, good to see you again. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> We've talked about this, and I've heard the recommendations. I, my first question is, what's the fourth trail? Uh, the Lewis and Clark. Ah. So that go? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, when these things come together, we have a big plan to put this stuff, and we want to work closely with you. Uh, my understanding of the difference between national and what we would call our city or more historic is that you can have businesses along our trails, sure. the one that we're recommending and stuff like that, so that the people could uh, enhance your uh, availability to drinks and other things along the trail. Whereas on the national, they don't allow that unless you have uh, certain licensing aspects. Um, I think you're thinking about uh, scenic byways. And so in that particular program, there are some um, restrictions on development close to the um, corridors in order to sort of preserve them as scenic. But in the case of a National Historic Trail, I mean, they really want um, to get us More close business. to um, sites to be able to That's why the enhance heads the, there, the yeah. visitor experience. And so right. uh, we had a former mayor in uh, Sugar Creek who was very big on this, and mm -hmm. he brought us a lot of things that uh, feed into this. Uh, I want it the trails to go up through the fourth. <laughs> so I don't want them to just stop somewhere and then go, uh, uh, their route to Raytown to go somewhere through the fourth. <laughs> but we're working on that, but we look forward to continuing the cooperation that has already been done. Great, well, we appreciate that. Okay, um, anything else? Uh, thanks, Marlene, Thank I've, you, you know, been very involved with this and you know seeing it at many mark meetings it's great to see you know this presentation this evening i mean clearly by looking at the map independence owns the abundance of existing historic trail sites along this entire route yes. from sugar creek to gardner junction and <laughs> then beyond so uh we certainly have put a lot of emphasis into trail planning and especially in independence for all and connecting these historic sites um, together in our city and then you know outside of our city limits. So we've um, been very successful in securing some funding, but this will certainly help us to continue to secure funding for the portions of um, the trail that are in independence and hopefully as Councilman has said, um, attract additional tourism and commerce along these trail systems. So we're very, very excited um, about it and glad to be a part of this program. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have a presentation on the Independence Clean Indoor, Indoor Act, I'm sorry, Clean Indoor Air Act proposed update. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, independence really has been over the years a leader when it comes to uh, regulations around uh, the utilization of tobacco products. Um, first with our Clean Indoor Act that was adopted several years ago and most recently our leadership on Tobacco 21. Um, but I guess we can be proud that we haven't rested on our laurels. Our Board of Health uh, has come forward with additional recommendations uh, to modify the Clean Indoor Air Act proposal. Um, and at this evening, this meeting at the direction of the council, um, we're bringing those forward for you for your contemplation and consideration to see if we uh, want to take those uh, forward. So uh, we're joined tonight by two members of the Board of Health, Drs. Uh, Ralph Ruckman and Don Potts, and I would yield to them for a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Dr. Ralph K. Ruckman, and I'm the chair of the Advisory Board of Health for the City of Independence. Tonight, I'm accompanied by Dr. Donald Potts, 
a fellow board member as well as Professor Emeritus with the UMKC School of Medicine. He's also a Mayo Clinic Certified Tobacco Treatment Specialist. Dr. Potts has been instrumental in the drafting of the Clean Indoor Air Ordinances for Kansas City, Olathe, Lee Summit, and Independence. Dr. Potts will be presenting the board's recommendations for the proposed updates to the Independence Clean Indoor Air Act. Dr. Potts. Thank you, Al. Madam Mayor, city council members, thank you for allowing us to come here tonight. Um, looking back, we have come a long way, if you will, in the last 13 years. Uh, there was a lot of antagonism at the beginning of this thing. Uh, people had all kinds of ideas of what they should and shouldn't do. But over the years, uh, it has become more normal to be a smoke-free community, and more and more are doing that. Uh, we have now 30-some-odd states that have smoke-free laws that are statewide. Missouri not being one of them, unfortunately. Kansas <laughs> is. Um, but uh, w the uh, Board of Health, over a period of several years, had talked about changes and updating uh, of the uh, ordinances that we have. Uh, and then uh, uh, Andrew Worland founded a uh, uh, committee to uh, come up with some suggestions, which they did, and then uh, it, it kind of fell by the wayside when the, when the uh, uh, health department quit operating. But the uh, Independence Advisory Board of Health has maintained uh, a, a presence and a concern about the health of the citizens of Independence. And these are some of the suggestions that, uh, that the uh, entire group came up with, if I can figure this thing out, let's see. Okay, this is a summary of the present code. Uh, where is the summary of the present code? <laughs> I thought this was gonna be in here. There you go. Oh, I got you there. Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, as most of you know, uh, it's been in effect about 13 years. It was, went into effect on, uh, uh, in March of, 19, of 2006, uh, 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 and uh, has been rather effective. There have been very few complaints and almost none in the last uh, few years that I understand. And as you know, private residences are exempted uh, unless they have a child care unit or a daycare unit. Uh, private vehicles are exempted. And currently, 20% uh, of our hotel and motel rooms uh, are exempt. Uh, and that particular uh, portion of the ordinance uh, has been changing in other, uh, other cities across the country. Uh, but uh, it's something which, of course, the uh, people uh, who rent those, the hotel people, like to have that. In most cases, when that's uh, happened, uh, they have to maintain the same percentage. The same rooms have to be the same. They can't take 20% from one area and 10 from another. Um, and then the private rooms and semi-private rooms in nursing homes are now exempt, providing that the people who live there, one or two more people who actually live there, uh, smoke and agree to allow smoking there. The problem we have with that is that the employees are not protected. And people in adjoining rooms or any room that's attached to the air, air unit, uh, those people are also at risk for secondhand tobacco smoke. Our Surgeon General has come up with some pretty good uh, definite uh, uh, statistics about secondhand smoke. 
used to be, it was just kind of a nuisance, and now we realize how dangerous secondhand smoke can be. Actually, in some instances, more dangerous than primary smoke, the person who's smoking themselves. Uh, any questions about the current code? Anybody? Okay, let's see what we can do here. Ah, okay. We have some proposed updates. Uh, most of you are aware, uh, if you, unless you don't read a paper, or, that uh, vaping, which is rather an inaccurate term, has come uh, into the forefront uh, by, it was started by a Chinese person uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, it became rather common in the United States, uh, and uh, uh, they called, they start out calling them electronic cigarettes, trying to get the idea, well, they're, you know, keeping up. They actually are electric, they're not electronic. It's a, it's a small heater that heats up the tobacco in there or the nicotine solutions. And uh, in, in the idea of the nicotine solutions is that you can put not only nicotine in those things, but you can put a lot of other things. And they're selling a lot of other things. One of the most common things is what they call hash oil, which actually is uh, cannabis, it's marijuana. And you can easily put it in the liquid form into one of the electronic cigarettes. So. So we d feel very strongly that we like to have uh, what's now called alternative nicotine delivery uh, uh, devices, I guess is what they're called, all right. Um, and uh, so what has happened, that the number of uh, young people, by young people I mean 13, to 16 has increased by several hundred percent in the last three or four years because of something called a jewel. A jewel uh, looks like a USB drive that you stick in your computer and they actually use that for charging up the heating element in there. And it looks just like that. Uh, a little bit longer, but it looks just like a, a USB drive. And uh, those are the things that the kids sitting in the back of the room are, are using because some, of the, some types of those don't have any, any vapor or, or any sort of a, a smoke that, come, that comes out of it. And so they sometimes have a smell and depending on what it is, it can be de identified. But um, that's, what, that's what kids are doing. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the reasons that we uh, passed the Tobacco 21 law to include vaping, because what had happened and is happening is the kids who are 18 and can buy those things, uh, they buy them for their 12, 13, 14 year old friends uh, so that they can actually go ahead and smoke, which is one reason we didn't include any sort of a uh, uh, penalty for catching young people who are smoking, but just for the purchase of them. We like to restrict uh, the uh, smoking near entrances better than it is now. Most places now that have uh, comprehensive uh, smoke-free ordinances uh, use f about 15 foot, somewhere between 15 foot and 20 foot. Some have 25 foot uh, from entrances, open doorways, open windows, air uh, ventilation systems, because those certainly are very, very vulnerable to bringing in the, uh, the smoke and tobacco smoke from, from outside. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the problems we have had elsewhere, and also probably might have here, is that some of the sidewalks in front of these uh, places, especially downtown, don't have 15 foot from the front door to the curb. Uh, and so what the, the uh, retail people say, well, they'd have to walk out into the street. Then if they got hit by a car, we'd hold the city responsible. Um, so we, we would have to look at that and, and either think about an exemption 
depending on the, on the amount of uh, space there is there. Uh, but most of us, uh, I've talked to a lot of people, have had the unfortunate honor of walking through a bunch of people smoking to get into a restaurant or a bar or something like that. Uh, and uh, that's not only distasteful, but it's also dangerous. These are toxic fumes that have cancer-bearing chemicals in them. We like to restrict the smoking at bus stops uh, at, or transportation stops, um, open shelters or whatever they are, similar to the one we have out here across, across the way. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is when, uh, what, three years ago, maybe I think yeah, three, four years ago, uh, the city put in heating elements in, the, in that unit over there, the, uh, the uh, what, it, it's the, what, what's the name? Transportation of the, center. The transportation, is that what we call it? Okay. Uh, which was a neat idea for people out in the cold, but that rather immediately disenfranchised the 70 some odd percent of our population that doesn't smoke from getting up close to the heat if they didn't like the, the tobacco smoke. Most places now, if they have a comprehensive law, include outdoor transportation stops for that. This would also allow us to be listed by the Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights as a, uh, having a comprehensive uh, clean air law. That's the one thing that keeps us from doing it, actually. The uh, next one is change the definition of enclosed space. I have to kind of laugh about this to some extent. Uh, there's a restaurant, downtown Kansas City. I have to say it's owned by an attorney. And uh, after the Kansas City law was passed, uh, they decided by looking at it and really, really looking into it that it said that a wall went from floor to ceiling sounds reasonable, but they decided if they cut off three inches from the bottom of a wall, that it no longer is considered a wall. <laughs> and when that was brought up, they actually won that because the law said it had to go from floor to ceiling. So we'd like to kind of preempt anybody maybe trying to do that by, by uh, eliminating or at least modifying that definition somewhat. The next thing is restricting multi-unit housing units. Again, we're stuck with the idea that anybody smoking that in any sort of a building where there is air circulation, which includes all buildings, uh, the air gets into other areas where it's not intended to be. Or, and, uh, can't help that. The only way that can be done is if every every single unit or every room or every uh, 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 section, whatever you want to call it, would have a completely separate air handling system, which has been deemed pretty uh, 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 unavailable in terms of cost. Um, and uh, they have been able to show very clearly many times that air in, uh, in, in, in a uh, apartment building uh, cannot be kept out of other, place, other apartments in that building. Uh, you go to a restaurant and they sometimes, not around here, thank goodness, but elsewhere, and they'll have a big air handling unit saying, well, you can sit over here, this is the non-smoking section. You've heard this before, but I have to get a kick out of it. Having a non-smoking section in a restaurant is like having a non-peeing section in a swimming pool. It gets there anyway, <laughs> no matter what you do. Uh, and the Society of Air Conditioning and Ventilation Engineers have determined that in order not to have secondhand smoke settling in uh, in, in any areas, it would have to have hurricane strength 
air, which is with the 120, 125 mile an hour uh, air to keep things from depositing where they shouldn't. Uh, in multi-unit housing units in several areas, uh, they have been very, very successful. Some of them have had, in Kansas City, for instance, they had a uh, one-year uh, uh, vacation, if you would. Uh, they, they would, you could stay there for a year if you smoked, but then you either had to quit smoking or you had to move out. Uh, and some of the people in Kansas City felt that that was, uh, uh, it was uh, discriminatory for people because, quote, it's their home, which it is. Uh, but that doesn't allow people to poison other people just because they happen to live in that particular home. So uh, most of the people that have done this have done it, uh, well, the government has, has uh, required uh, government uh, housing. Christina, you, look, you reminded me of that. Uh, the government has uh, stated that in government-sponsored housing, they cannot smoke, is that right now? Okay, so, but there are many, many other housing units around, multi-unit multi housing units, where people are exposed to other people's smoke. Um, we talked about briefly about long-term care units and lodging, and uh, there is, the city has done a really good job of uh, reinforcing and enforcing uh, the uh, smoking and non-smoking. When, when this was first, I don't know, remember whether it's actually in the ordinance, but when it was first proposed, uh, they uh, were giving a exemption to fire departments where the firefighters spend the night, and it was, it's their home for the night, if you will. Uh, and, uh, and that seemed pretty reasonable because it, it'd be difficult getting out in the middle of the night sometime. My understanding, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, that the, vol the firefighters have voluntarily agreed to go non-smoking in those places. And I, I'm really, really tickled about that. I, I'm, I'm really uh, excited that they would do that. You know. Move on a little bit here. I won't take too much long. We talked about vapor and the alter alternative nicotine devices. Uh, the surgeon, let me read that for sure. The Surgeon General has shown that uh, high school students using e-cigarettes has risen from 1.5% in 2011 to 16% four years later in 2015. Uh, all of the e-cigarette companies have been purchased by the tobacco companies. Uh, and they, they know that the use of tobacco is go going down and has gone down and uh, Nationwide now, are na people who smoke tobacco are down around 15 percent. When it used to be 30 and 35, at least when some of us were young, uh, and uh, so uh, that's been healthy in a lot of ways. The problem is that more and more kids are using e-cigarettes at a young age, 12, 13, and uh, get the number. I'm sorry. But a, a large number of them, so I don't want to give you a wrong number, a large number of them convert to tobacco when they, you know, when they get a little older, 18, 19, or 20, uh, which is a lot worse. We know a lot of bad things about e-cigarettes, a lot of toxic things uh, that uh, they didn't think were there, but they are. Uh, a lot of them come from the flavors and of course, the tobacco companies say, oh, we're not really targeting the kids, but why do they have bubblegum flavors and cherry malts and things like that for flavors? Mm. Uh, and they, they are doing some pretty good advertising. Advertising, $1.2 million a day advertising by the tobacco companies. Uh, you, you can't uh, counteract a whole lot very easily. Um, the entrances, we talked about that. Um, 
so that hopefully people wouldn't have to go through tobacco smoke to get to into a building or sit by a window where people are smoking underneath them. There's at least one restaurant, uh, one restaurant here that has an opening between the outside deck and the inside restaurant, and it's wide open. They don't allow smoking, of course, inside, but four foot away on the deck, they allow smoking because our law doesn't cover that. So there needs to be some something that would cover where food is served, uh, especially with kids, because kids are so more so much more vulnerable to the bad effects of tobacco and other things. <coughs> Bus stops, we talked about that. Uh, the enclosed space, I didn't want to really give all attorneys a bad name, but uh, those guys were pretty sneaky in cutting the bottom of the wall off. Uh, Multi-unit housing, uh, lodging, long-term care. City property is doing very well. Uh, my understanding is that the city has a policy now about smoking in parks rather than a law. It, am I right about that? Yes. Christina, okay. Uh, that would make it a lot easier, I think, for enforcement if it was actually a law. Uh, right now, we have signs up, which has worked pretty well, I understand, not, not only here but elsewhere, that because of the kids being there, you know, tell them not to smoke. But I think it would be probably a good step up to actually make that an ordinance. Uh, that's something you guys, of course, would have to decide. Enforcement, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, has not been a problem. Uh, uh, typically, self-policing uh, has taken care of the problem with proper education, which we did 13 years ago. We did a pretty good education problem there. Um, but that would help uh, enforcement of this. Okay, questions? Um, thank you, Dr. Potts, Dr. Ruckman, for being here. Um, I, along with the rest of the council, had received a, um, some information from the Advisory Board of Health some weeks ago to outlining some of these recommendations, <coughs> so I hope that many of us had had an opportunity maybe to review some of these. Um, you know, first of all, I want to congratulate our community in no small part to you two gentlemen and our advisory board of health. We truly have been a leader in public health in this region with the Clean Indoor Act in 2006, and then we were, in fact, the first um, city in the region to adopt Tobacco 21, and I think it, it has made a very positive impact. Um, we also, at the city, have restricted um, the use, uh, restricting smoking certainly in and around our public facilities, as you mentioned. So I think those are all making positive changes. There's many things in here that I think are, um, you know, very appropriate, um, certainly including vaping products, which did not exist in 2006. Seems like a very logical thing to be able to include, to expand that definition and, um, look at those ordinances that reference smoking or tobacco and to um, make those amendments. Um, the things that I have concerns about, I, I suppose, is, um, is enforcement. I mean, we can restrict um, smoking on city property in our parks we can you know pass an ordinance it's very th that it's very difficult to enforce that i mean it, there is a sense of if it's posted then maybe people will recognize that that's something that they're not allowed to do and self-police themselves but they may not and the the you know actual the reality of us going out and writing a ticket for something like that is probably pretty unrealistic. I mean, we have littering ordinances. We see that obviously people still litter. We have noise ordinances. 
Obviously, people still played loud music, you know, those, those types of things. So I am a little concerned about the enforcement on that. And again, at the bus stops, um, we have indie bus stops that we control. We have KC8, um, ATA bus stops that aren't under our jurisdictions. I mean, generally, they're we're, in the we're public. We're working on them, by the way. Public realm, yes. Um, and, you know, how you enforce that, you can certainly, you know, put a sign, no smoking at the bus stop, but, you know, the reality of enforcing that is probably pretty um, unlikely. Um, restricting smoking near entrances, um, I, you know, am going to really be reluctant to impose additional restrictions on things that were not included in the original um, ballot issue that was put before the voters. Voters voted on certain things with certain expectations, and I, we have an obligation. I, I feel that my obligation would be, if we were going to change what the voters approved, then we need to take some of those, we need to really take a hard look at that and potentially take that back to the voters to see if we could expand the authority that was put in um, at that time. Um, I'm going to have a very difficult time, you know, regulating private, what private businesses do in the public realm. I mean, how do you tell a restaurant that people can't smoke in front of their restaurant when they, you know, I just think that becomes very complicated. We have put in that at public buildings that you can't smoke within 20, I think it's 20 feet of the entrance of City Hall, fire stations, um, any, you know, Sermon Center, Palmer Center, any of our city-owned um, buildings, but I, I, I think that it's problematic to start mandating that for private businesses. Um, the restriction on lodging um, and long-term care, again, I think we would um, need to have some conversations with our um, Hotel and Motel Alliance and um, make those dis distinctions. I do believe, I mean, I want to say I believe that it would be beneficial not only to the guests um, and visitors and the employees to restrict that, but I am going to be reluctant to put additional restrictions on private businesses when that was not included in what the voters were asked to approve in 2006. Um, so, you know, that said, I think we're gonna clearly, you know, need some more time to really dissect each one of these recommendations, see which ones are in compliance with, um, what the voters approved. Things are technicalities, I think, like including the vaping products, that seems logical. Um, and then, you know, really have further discussion about what restrictions we're going to put on private industries moving forward regarding this. Comments or questions? Yes, Councilman. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Potts and Dr. Ruckman, uh, for being here tonight. I. Um, First of all, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about the vaping because I've heard some things myself. I was sitting in Silverstein Eye Center Arena last year and we had a couple people vaping. Uh, as people were coming in, they were sitting there and you could see the vapor going up. Eventually, um, the security people came over and told them they couldn't do that. But that vape that went into the, that vapor that went into the auditorium there at Silverstein everybody got a taste of and and so i've heard that that vapor depending on flavors and other things that are in it the oils never leave the lungs some of the oils from that vapor never leave the lungs so in that case it could be even more uh, health uh, of a health problem than even um, smoking because smoking at least there's a filter uh, but the vapor with that, those types of elements or the nicotine, there's no filter for the nicotine. You're actually getting more nicotine. Uh, can you address some of those things yeah. about the vapor? True. You get more nicotine 
out of a, an e-cigarette than you can a regular cigarette. And it's more concentrated, so it does get in the lungs a lot easier. A very recent article uh, from Lancet, the British Medical Journal, teenagers who use e-cigarettes have a much higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. It's linked. Once, not using regular cigarettes, it's linked. but just e-cigarettes. Yeah. And that's brand new. It, it just came out uh, very in the last week or two. And I haven't pursued that further, but uh, I thought that was an interesting, even if it's only half right, you know, that's something to be thinking about. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, most of the toxins come from the flavors, but not necessarily. Uh, some of it actually comes, because they haven't been around long enough to do any really intense medical studies, which usually take 10 to 15 years to see how something's going to happen later down the line. Uh, and so we're still in the process of, of really trying to, uh, to evaluate those things. So, But uh, it... Uh, what worries me, of course, is the, is the kids because they start, and I think it, at at the at the bottom of our uh, uh, bottom of our uh, literature from the city, it says, "Is it good for the kids?" Well, one one of the studies I had read about smoking and vaping, but uh, of course, kids' brains because they are still developing even at at age 16 and 18 are much more susceptible to the nicotine and to the addiction to nicotine than say somebody in their 20s or 30s. And so it's, it's a lot more likely that they will quickly become addicted to the nicotine in Absolutely the e-cigarette. Right. E and cigarettes. most people don't realize heroin is less addictive than nicotine. <laughs> nicotine is more addictive than heroin. Than heroin yeah. Something to think about because kids do are much more susceptible, the brains are much more susceptible uh, at that age. And that's why, that's why we raised it from 18 to 21, which I applaud you the, all for. The restriction near entrances, <coughs> the only concern I have is people having to walk through it. And I've had to do that in, in certain instances at uh, particular businesses um, or at nursing homes. It's not pretty. It's not nice to have to walk into a nursing home and walk through the smoke because they're sitting right outside the entrance. Uh, some of the hospitals, I know Centerpoint does not allow it on their grounds or in the cars on the grounds. So you can't sit in your car in their parking lot smoke. You actually have to leave their parking lot and their property to smoke. Uh, so they don't allow it any place on their campus um, and a lot of the hospitals are going to that. They don't want any risk, at least of that health concern, especially if people have COPD and all the other breathing problems or if they're around some of the oxygen. Uh, and there's a lot more people using oxygen in some of the, the public facilities nowadays. So I don't have a problem restricting it to up to 20 feet from an entrance. Uh, I think it's in the long term for the best health of independence and for the children as well. Um, my other concern is with, especially with long-term care and lodging, uh, because they, most of them share some sort of air handling units. Maybe not per room, but they share it in the hallways, they share it in the common spaces where the drinks are, where the bar is, where the... Um, ice machines are, uh, elevators, all that sort of thing. Weight rooms. Weight rooms. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns also, and I wish some of our firefighters who were here earlier were still here, uh, a year or two ago when we had discussions about the sprinkler system and we had a couple architects uh, give us all the updated information, almost all the fires that occur, occur usually in places where people sleep almost all of them, and they don't occur in places of business that are only uh, occupied during the day, waking hours, it's usually where people sleep. And so these are the areas, the, the multi-unit housing areas and the lodging, uh, uh, the lodging and long-term care facilities are where people sleep, and that's where they're gonna fall asleep with either an e-cigarette, <laughs> 
that has a heater and could light a fire or an actual cigarette. And so I don't have a problem. In fact, I think it would lower our risk of fires uh, if we did that. It's going to make, make things safer, and I, I would think that the firefighters would advocate for that as well. Um, because those are the areas maybe that aren't sprinkled. Some of the old ones uh, come under the grandfather clause that they're not sprinkled. And so um, by doing this, we actually lower the risk of fires and independence. So. And you also, if you read the papers, about once every other week, someone has an e-cigarette, blows up in their face, and they yes. have to have all kinds of plastic surgery and things like that. Uh, uh, it, it's it's happening more and more. Well, they're lithium-ion batteries. Some of them are lithium-ion batteries, yeah. which have the potential to explode. That's right. right. Okay, <coughs> any other comments or questions? Yes, Councilman. Um, most of the studies done in the past have been by the cigarette companies. And your stats, well, well-meaning, and I think are low. I think you have an even greater argument if if the we could go back and make the studies unbiasedly. I would have gave you across the board okay, but I greatly uh, am appreciative of your input here, Mayor. Uh, we have to look at the other side of this too, and I think there's a little more reasoning to be done. When I read it, I thought, why not? I mean. Uh, I was always taught that example is the worst thing that you can do for somebody if it's a bad one. And uh, these e-cigarettes are the worst example of this situation. It's catching on and we're always catching up to a new invention. We haven't got the stats, but we know they're there. Uh, to be ahead of the curve is what you're proposing. And I have no problem with that. but the cautions by the mayor we certainly are going to look into this and push this forward as fast as and as good as we can but with those concerns the tobacco companies have always been pretty sneaky uh, and uh, they we have a video of the eight largest tobacco company ceos about 10 years ago in front of congress raising their hands and saying Tobacco is is not addictive. Every one of them, <laughs> one by the to the other. They're the ones. By the way, uh, our our uh, the other thing we're going to have to change is that our law says that something has to be ignited. And tobacco companies are now coming out with cigarettes that are heated, but not ignited or burning. So another thing about being ahead of the curve, you have to think about some of the what possibilities are coming up. Um, Ms. Uh, Ma mm -hmm. Madam Mayor uh, and Council, if I may, <clears throat> what we've done tonight uh, is uh, a preliminary presentation. And so if you have uh, further questions that are specific about any issue, I'd be more than happy to address those with more accurate and more precise information so that you know some of the decisions that might be made will have um, you know the support and uh, you know a little bit more information that I think will um, help to make the decisions that you need to make and so uh, I just wanted to make sure you were aware that this is kind of a preliminary presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming tonight. Could I say one more thing? Yes. Um, as far as enforcement goes I you know we haven't I think been over the top with any of the enforcement up until now. Uh, and I think a lot of the enforcement, like in society, is peer pressure. And so just by enacting the ordinance and maybe not having any other substantive enforcement, I think the fact that there is an ordinance and that the, and that the city is saying that this is the way it is, there's going to be peer pressure. There's going to be 70% of the population that doesn't smoke or doesn't use the vaping products that are going to help enforce it and, and, and reinforce it to people that are. Um, and it's, it's going to be on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, um, and I don't think there has to be any 
other teeth necessarily in the law at this point. So I would agree with that. And uh, one thing that I will uh, applaud the city, the citizens, when we voted, we had a 60% uh, or 61% roughly, um, you know, favorability of support vote. And that is amazing. And uh, I'm just excited to think of how many people, how many lives have been changed and people that are still alive today because of the uh, uh, restrictions that have been made and uh, you know, how their behaviors and habits have changed as a result as well. Thanks for your attention and uh, we Thank appreciate you. any other questions you may have later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our staff report. Mr. City Manager, Highway Safety e-ticketing application. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, a big focus for the council this year has been on public safety and we've talked a lot about staffing, we've talked a lot about facilities, but certainly another component of that is equipment. Uh, Chief Halsey met with me last week and let me know about an exciting opportunity to pursue e-ticketing, which would help from both an efficiency standpoint, but also modernization of uh, police practices. Um, a component of that grant application, though, does involve a presentation of the council, so uh, both for the council's benefit, but also as part of our application, we wanted to get on your radar this evening. Chief. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council, Brad Halsey, Chief of Police. Again, as stated, we are seeking a grant application that's due this Friday with the Missouri Department of Transportation for e-ticketing. Uh, what this would do is the department is seeking funds to purchase the equipment and software necessary to establish e-ticketing within the traffic unit. Currently, officers handwrite all tickets. This can be time-consuming, especially when issuing multiple citations. With the advanced technology of e-ticketing, our officers will greatly increase their efficiency, along with enhancing officer safety by utilizing real-time data while in the field and also spending less time on a roadside. Um, officers are able to swipe and scan state driver's license and electronically complete their citations. This drastically cuts down on the time spent issuing a citation or filling in repetitive information. Once the citations are completed, the information is directly uploaded to ENCODE, and this direct upload will eliminate the need for duplicate entry by the officer and court sorry, and the court clerks, along with the clerks reading all the handwritten citations. So if we uh, obtain the grant that we are seeking, it will provide equipment for e-ticketing for the 20 vehicles assigned to the traffic unit. And about 75% of our tickets uh, that are completed are officers assigned to the traffic unit. So. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to address those. So, Chief, um, who are you, um, where is the grant coming from? Department of Transportation. Okay, yes. and then how much is the, how much can we apply for, how much funding can we We're apply applying for? for the 20 units with printers and the equipment would be right under $88,000. Okay, very good. Any other comments or questions? There is no match. No, no match. match, that's just, yeah, oh. We'll right. have small reoccurring cost after that, but again, the efficiency of this we have a lot of duplicated efforts within our records unit and also across the street. So this will be serving as a pilot project. Obviously, if we did it department-wide, that's additional funding, but we want to start with the unit that writes the most tickets to make sure that we address any bugs with the system, so to speak. Very good. Thank you. Is, Thank you. is this a state system, so it's linked to the rest of the state and pulls up? No, not necessarily. There's a lot of different programs out there okay. that does the same thing. but this will be adaptable within our, within our own system. Thanks. Great, yes, Councilman. So they've done this somewhere else? Yes. Okay, because yeah. uh, it opens up. most other places. <laughs> yeah, this is not, unfortunately, we're just a little bit behind the curve yeah. on this, this specific technology. Well, me? Uh, well, I can move on. No, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you have it someplace else and the you know when you make the stop there's always a did you see this was it this many inches off the ground and everything it doesn't open us up to further things i mean these are things that have been addressed in other places Correct. right yes okay uh this is great yes okay thank you chief thank you anything else no thank okay. you uh, Mr. City Manager, Communications Plan and Strategy 2019. Yeah, I'm going to ask our uh, Public Information Officer, Meg Lewis, to give you an update this evening, uh, just again as part of our commitment and independence for all to enhance customer communication. Um, Meg has done a good job focusing on uh, our areas for 2019 and wanted to make sure the, the Council and the community were aware of those strategies. So I will yield to Meg. Good evening, Mr. City Manager, Public Information Officer. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So we wanted to give you an update on what we were focusing on in 2019, but to do that, we're going to start in 2018. Um, looking back, we, as you saw in each of the quarterly updates, continue to exceed our growth on our social media platforms. Um, we have a very dynamic engagement with our citizens on there. Posts are being shared more often. Um, one of our posts, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, was shared more than a thousand times. Um, so people are looking there for information and regularly um, sharing that with their peers. We have more than doubled our video production and increased viewership of these videos by 70%. So more people are turning into YouTube and watching those videos both live and after the meetings. We have added a multimedia communications coordinator to our team and um, we are really excited about that. And I'd like to take a moment. I am incredibly excited about the team that works for the city on communications. Zach, Faith, and Steve are all behind the scenes in many ways and don't get to talk to you guys on a regular basis and they're doing tremendous things for the city on a regular basis. So um, I'm really proud of what they're doing and what we've put together for the team. Um, we have also updated the communication plan, which I'm happy to provide you a copy of. We will be now updating it with a new brand and um, the graphic standards that are a part of that into that new communications plan as well. Facebook, as you guys can see in that graph, continues to grow. Um, that was January 2018 to this year. We have added a lot of people. Mm -hmm to our Facebook following. Um, Next door also is growing. We are up to about 19% of the eligible households in Independence using Nextdoor. Um, so we continue to grow on that plat platform. Instagram, well, 712 followers doesn't seem like a lot. It's a big increase year over year over the last two years. And Twitter, we continue to add sort of those um, Key followers, that's more often where our media are following and looking at what we're doing. So I put on this post some of the top posts from 2018. The one on your left corner there is the uh, MoDOT post that we announced that 70 would be closing for uh, work on the bridges that weekend. As you can see, it reached almost uh, 100,000 people and um, was engaged with multiple times, which shows that people are looking to us for updates on different pieces. Our What's That's, which is in the top right-hand corner, continue to be a huge hit with our citizens. They love learning about those new buildings and what's going on, what the building projects are happening there. Um, and then tweets again, Roadwork was one of our top posts um, there. So now switching to 2019, some of our general goals, um, we want to increase our proactive positive stories related to the City of Independence. Today we got to announce that we have the second best water in the United States and one of the top waters in the world, which uh, seven out of the eight years we have been able to claim that fame, but um, number two in the United States is pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking to create opportunities to regularly uh, engage with the public in open forums. So we tried over the fall some um, budget meetings and we'll continue to look for opportunities where we have town halls or open engagement um, for the citizens to engage with us. We're working on a Facebook FAQ with our two chiefs, um, the police and fire in March. So look to that and Social media is a way for us to directly engage with our citizens too, so we want to continue to grow those likes and follows on social media. So media outreach goals, we want to regularly communicate with the local media regarding events and programs and grow relationships with local media and key members of editorial teams. I put this example up with you, those regularly communicating with local media, it can be as simple as sharing our newsletter. So I shared this newsletter um, in December with our local media partners and within that week we had multiple stories on our street crimes unit. So we know that they're paying attention and can be um, looking to those opportunities there. Um, 
social media, we have expanded the use of video already um, tremendously in the months of January and February with the weekly's man weekly manager's minutes. You may have noticed the PD Thursday videos that we are doing and the Fire Friday videos. So we are doing at least three videos on social media every week, but then we're also looking for opportunities to use video to tell stories throughout the week on different topics. This video of the um, time capture of the plows going down Nolan Road was very well received and gave us a different look at what our city crews are doing on a regular basis. And we're trying to continue to create and maintain a regular content calendar with up-to-date information. Um, it changes year over year, and what we need to share with our citizens changes as we have different focuses. So this is a look at just some of the videos that we have done so far this year. Um, the first video on the left was a news brief. Instead of typing out what had happened at a fire, I asked uh, Assistant Chief Didimore to give me a video brief of it and then posted that just like he would have done a news interview to our citizens. They loved it. It was an easy way for them to understand what was going on and it was more visually attractive to them than just the copy of those Independence Fire Briefs. Um, the second is one of our Fire Friday videos um, where Glenda Neasley is explaining how our crews protect themselves when they go into a fire. The third there is the mayor's uh, state of the city, and then the fourth is that time-lapse video. City 7, we are continuing to grow and expand our Inside Independence Library. If you have not seen these, we share them on social media as well, but it's a unique look at some of the um, programs or departments that are serving our citizens, and I have a screen up here in the next slide to show a few of those. We're working on creating a minimum of five news segments each month, um, that are highlighting departments, events, programs, and venues. And we um, continue to find new ways to look at things, and Faith has done a tremendous job of looking at new ideas for Inside Independence, um, which we'll look at in, again in the next um, slide. Um, one of the requests was the ability for the presenter to control the council chamber presentations from the dais. As you guys can see, as I am controlling that right here, we are continuing to update the, the council chambers to be um, more friendly to our presenters and working at other venues in the city to try to do that as well. And we are working to complete updates to City Hall to allow service-specific information on TVs. That may be a longer-term goal, but the idea is when citizens are in our lobbies, they can find information that is specific to visitors that are here. So if they need to pay their taxes, the TV screen would say, you should be at this courthouse. Or if they need to um, go to the municipal court, they would know that it's on the first level. And all of those sort of in-house messages that are unique to those that are visiting the city of, of Independent City Hall. These are three of the recent inside independences that the team has worked on. The Criminal Investigations Division, Park Recreation and Tourism, and the third one is a little bit harder to read, but I think is one of our most unique that has been done this year, and that is a Hiram Young School, and it was an interview with some of the former students of the Hiram Young School um, as part of our hat tip to Black History Month and the unique role that that school played in our community's history. Additionally, we're having a quarterly focus. So this first quarter, we are heavily focused on public safety. So that's why we have really upticked our videos and interaction with police and fire. Um, later this week, I will be going on a ride along, tweet along with our fire department and showing sort of what a day in the life of the fire department looks like. Um, we are working on a, a police department version of that as well. And then we have the FAQ with the chiefs um, and um, some other announcements there. We've also focused each, um, at least one part of each um, city scene has had a hat tip to either a story about our police or fire department or actual content from our police and fire department. Second quarter, we'll be focusing on tourism and the branding implementa implementation. That is when our uh, tourism sites open. And so it's prime time for us to highlight the many venues that we have in the city. 
Two things that you guys have focused on in your goals over the last two years are blight and the new housing plan. So we'll look at that in the third quarter and then uh, fourth quarter economic and workforce development and the unique things that have been going on in those will be what we'll talk about. So that's sort of a quick overview of what we're focusing on this year. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about the communication strategy um, and excited about what we've been able to do. Okay, thank you very much. Other comments or questions from the council? Yes. Thank you, Meg. Um, sounds great. I, I'm looking forward to a lot of these uh, these projects and goals for the for the year. I was wondering, since um, the school district has just put in a TV studio within a block or so of mm -hmm. <laughs> City Hall over here, and I, I guess they're starting up their video journalism. Uh, I don't know that it started yet, mm -hmm. but it would be, I think, desirable to, to network with them and partner with them and maybe ask them to do some some little video stories for us as both experience for them and also a benefit for the city. And if we needed to do something in a studio, mm -hmm. I mean, they've got one right there. We wouldn't have to duplicate a, a studio for the city if they would allow us to use it from time to time, so. That is definitely on our radar, and we have communicated with the city, uh, the school district that, of our interest to have the students help us with some of those pieces. As they were transitioning this year, we haven't quite made it across that finish line yet, but we're hopeful uh, we would love to do a, you know you're from independence with the students and have them show us that perspective. Great. Or the history of independence from their perspective. So there's definitely things we're talking to them about. Good. Any other comments or questions? I would say I think one of the best things that we've done in terms of communication was our inaugural Citizens Academy. Um, there's nothing like, you know, real people interacting with our, um, our city departments mm -hmm. and, and sharing that with their neighbors and their friends and their co-workers. So I know we're getting ready to launch season two of mm -hmm. uh, the Citizens Academy. Um, last I checked, I think we had one spot left, maybe. We're full, so. We have a yeah, waiting we have, list yeah, now. Yeah, we have yeah. a waiting list now. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a wonderful program that um, I think has been tremendous as well. And I. I do want to especially, again, you know, thank and acknowledge um, Steve and Faith and Zach. Uh, I mean, the tremendous work that they've been doing in designing and developing and filming and producing this video content. I mean, it's just made our communication and our engagement skyrocket. People, that's how people really want to get there content and they've done a really tremendous job and really put together you know, some, some great work that we can use over and over and over again. Um, the um, video that they produced for my state of the city was fantastic. The one that they produced for our Independence for All strategic plan update was really, really good. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I'd like to get those YouTube numbers up a little bit. Um, I think that's an area where we could put some focus to publicize that and, and share that a little bit because there's some, they've really done some great work with our, um, you know, limited resources um, that we have here. So that's um, something I'm very, very proud of. Um, okay, right there. Anything else? Anything else, Mr. City Manager? Nothing tonight. Thank We're you. Adjourned.